Thank you for joining us on WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchburg, Queen of Perpetual Help, and welcome to another edition of Local Matters. On this week's broadcast from Father Maurice, we conclude his talk on the Holy Eucharist and more. Please listen and enjoy. If the Eucharist comes from the Word, the second source from which the Eucharist flows as strangely as this might sound, is death. The Lord said, this is my body. As often as you eat of this and drink of this, you celebrate, you bring the memorial of my death until I come again. The Eucharist is the grain of wheat that falls to the ground and dies and produces a lot of abundant fruit. I don't want to turn you into a theology class, but in the Eastern theology, the fathers of the church taught that the death of Christ did not happen on Good Friday. The Latin, the Western church teaches that. But to the Eastern theologians, the death of Christ happened on Holy Thursday, at the time when the Lord said, this is my body, this is my blood. What is the logic behind that? The Eastern theologians will argue that once you separate body from blood, there is bleeding that leads to death. So Jesus starts dying. Immediately he institutes the Eucharist on Holy Thursday. Good Friday is the consummation, the fulfillment of his death. This is not to frighten us, but it is to show us something about the Eucharist. And that is, it is so valuable that someone had to die for it to come about. And not just any kind of person, God's own very son. St. John captures this in John 3, 16. He says, for God so loved the world. For God so loves you. For God is so crazy about you. For God is so obsessed about you. God dreams about you. You are God's Valentine day. That God sent his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him will not perish. That is very important to keep in mind because it tells us that the Eucharist comes from an action that confirms our dignity. Oftentimes, we think that our dignity is contingent on what others think about us, on what others say about us. You know, I'm not tall enough, I'm not beautiful enough, I'm not slim enough, I'm not blonde enough. And we have all these things that unintentionally make us to start feeling inferior to start feeling as if we're not good enough, we're not handsome enough, we're not beautiful enough. Who told you that? Every time we think about the Eucharist, it's an opportunity for us to remind ourselves. Pope Saint Leo the Great said, oh Christians, know your dignity. Know what you have costed God. If you are not valuable enough, why would God's own son give himself up to give you, in the form of bread, his own very self? Which means your dignity is invaluable. You are precious. You are worthy. You do not need any external validation to affirm your dignity and your greatness. The fact that the Lord gives you himself 
in the form of bread and wine should remind you of the great dignity that you have. In effect, you are so costly that you costed the father his only son. That is what it means to say that the Eucharist comes from death. Besides word and death, the third and final source of the Eucharist is the resurrection. That is why the church, in her wisdom, inserts the octave of the Eucharist into the season of Easter. St. Paul says, if Christ did not rise, we are the most miserable people. We are the most wretched of people. The Eucharist comes from the reason one. In the Gospel of Emmaus, which we would hear today at 4 p.m., which continues the previous account, we are told that the apostles are disillusioned. They have abandoned Jerusalem and they are going away. You know, when you are faced with tragedy, the normal human reaction is to fall back on your safe zone, is to fall back on your comfort zone, is to fall back on your secure zone. Whenever you face a certain shock that destabilizes you, the immediate human reaction is to run back to where you know best. And that's what you see in the accounts, the post-Easter accounts. Peter says, I'm going fishing. In other words, I'm going back to my trade. Perhaps these three years have just been one prolonged nightmare. Look at what the apostle says to Jesus. We had hoped that he would be the one to liberate Israel. We left everything. We left all our businesses and we came, we followed him. But he has been crucified and now we are left in the middle. We can't go forward, we can't go backward. All our hopes are dashed. And so loneliness sets in. We become fearful and frightful. This is something that the Eucharist does. The resurrection makes Jesus present everywhere. In the power of the resurrection, Jesus is no longer contained in one space. He can go through locked doors. He can go through walls. The resurrection means that Jesus now is in the power of God. And that is why he can come in and go out. And finally, he will say to them on the mount of the resurrection, all power has been given to me. Go out into the whole world, proclaim the good news. When we think of the Eucharist, therefore, it's important and helpful to remind ourselves that this gift that we are coming to receive, this gift that we spend time with every time we come for adoration, one of the most beautiful things about this parish, and for the poor, thank you very much for that, is the Eucharistic adoration that you have, the perpetual adoration. It's a beautiful thing. Again and again, the Lord has shown in revelations to the saints that he is always very pleased when we come to spend time with him. One of the beauties of being a Catholic, and I really love this about being a Catholic, is that whenever I walk into a Catholic church, I'm not walking into a hall, an empty hall. There is someone always waiting for me in the tabernacle. I am walking into the presence of a friend. I'm walking into a company of someone who cares about me, who loves me, who seeks my good, someone who has my back, someone who will never betray me, someone who will never walk away. And that is the great treasure that we have. Whenever we come to spend time with the Lord in the Eucharist, either in the tabernacle or exposed in perpetual adoration. 
Word, death, and resurrection, the three sources of the gifts of the Eucharist. The second part now, what next? What does all of this mean? The first thing I would like us to note is that with the gift of the Eucharist, God wants to be close to us. That is the first great reality that comes with the Eucharist. We are not alone. God wants to be very, very close to us. We live in a world in which there is so much information, so much noise, and at the same time, so much loneliness. But Jesus says, I will not leave you orphaned. I won't just walk away and abandon you. I will be with you. The Eucharist is the great presence. Whenever I have felt in my own Christian life, whenever I have felt like downside, you know, as human beings, we all have moments in which we feel like life is not worth living. We feel like, you know, like low energy, you could say. I have always drawn strength I've always drawn energy when I just go and spend time with the Lord in the Eucharist. There is no substitute for the time spent in Eucharistic adoration. There is no substitute. In one of the most priceless things that I give myself as a gift. I've always said, if I had to do it all over, I would still be a priest. You know why? because of the access that being a priest gives me to the Eucharist. To me, you know, sometimes there's so much noise in the church. Maybe the bishop is telling us this, the hierarchy is telling us that. When I just walk into my room, I walk into my space, I said, Maurice, you can celebrate Mass here, you can sit you quietly here with the Lord. You can spend this quiet time. You don't need anybody's permission. You don't need any authority. I am just okay. And that is why I said, if I had to do it all over, I would still be a priest. Because of the access that the priesthood gives me to the Eucharist. That is one of the things I would like us to remember. God is close to us. The Eucharist brings that closeness. The second thing that I would like us to remember about the Eucharist is the Eucharist as the meaning of life as self-gift. Oftentimes, the culture and the logic of the contemporary world seems to want to tell us that you are great, you are big, if you assert yourself, if you take a stand and show that you are in charge, if you are the one that called the shirts, but the Eucharist teaches us that the center of life is not self-assertion, but self-gift. The Lord says, this is my body given for you. So the Lord teaches us that the true measure of life is not self-assertion. The true measure of life is not hoarding. The true measure of life is to live a life of the gift. In fact, the true measure of love is to love without measure. Our Lord teaches us that when we give of ourselves like he does, then we find ourselves. So life is not about asserting ourselves. We find the true meaning, true happiness when we give of ourselves. Just as the Lord gives himself to us, the Lord calls us to give of ourselves. You will notice there are only two commandments that the Lord gives us at the end of his life, the Great Commission 
and the new commandment of love. The Eucharist is that reminder of us to give of ourselves, especially when it hurts and when it is challenging. It was challenging for our Lord, but as Scripture tells us, He loved those who were His own and loved them till the very end. The third aspect that I would like us to keep in mind as we reflect on the Eucharist is from the very word itself, Eucharist. It comes from the Greek Eucharistomen, which means thanksgiving. Look, I said to a friend last week, I said, you know, I give thanks to God, not because I have it all covered. No. I give thanks to God because where I am today is not where I was yesterday. And where I am today will not be where I would be tomorrow. Thanksgiving, if you look at the life of Jesus, you could describe Jesus as a man of thanksgiving. It does not mean that we don't have difficulties. Difficulties will be there. But if you look at, there is energy and power when you are capable and you are able to say to the Lord, Lord, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for being here. Lord, I thank you for sitting with you at this moment. Lord, I thank you that I am able to thank you. A friend said to me, but what if I don't feel it? I said to him, then you are a priest. I said, because you are offering thanksgiving for the whole world. You are offering thanksgiving for the couple that just had the new baby. You are offering thanksgiving for the newly word. You are offering thanksgiving for, for the child that just passed the exam. I said, so you are leaving your baptismal priesthood. I said, who told you that you only thank God for yourself? You thank God for everything. And that's the example that Jesus showed us. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks. Think about that. Jesus knew that less than six hours from that time, he would be arrested. He knew that the guards were on the way. He knew that Gethsemane would be the place of his arrest and that Calvary would be less than 24 hours, but he still gave thanks. What an example for us. So whenever you feel like, well, this is so depressing, my health is so depressing, my finance, I'm struggling, my children are not responding, my family members are not understanding me, Father Paul is not understanding me, the church is not understanding me, the group is not understanding me, do what Jesus did, give thanks. Give thanks. There is a spiritual energy that is unleashed when we give thanks. Sometimes when I get up in the morning and I'm like, one, two, three, four, I have a whole laundry list of things which are not okay. What I do consciously to fight that negativity is I pray Psalm 118. I start saying to the Lord, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his love endures forever. Let the house of Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say. So I consciously counteract that spirit of negativity. If Jesus could give thanks, knowing fully well that Judas had left to go bring those to come and arrest him, then we have no reason not to give thanks. Thanksgiving is not contingent on your feelings or on my feelings. That's what I'm saying in effect. Thanksgiving is a way of living. Thanksgiving is an act of the will. Thanksgiving is a decision. Thanksgiving is a choice. 
Thanksgiving is a judgment call. When we begin to give thanks, guess what happens? It makes us to start seeing the other differently. I don't see and start complaining. I begin to see that each one is a thought of God. I begin to see that each, each and every one of us is a gift to the other. Each and every one of us is a gift that God has placed. There are no accidents in the plan of God. It's not accident that you have this Cameroonian Irish man standing and talking to you with his Irish Bostonian accent. Each one of us is a gift. Each one of us is something that the Lord gives us. That is what thanksgiving does. The fourth aspect that I would like to remind us of, transubstantiation, the change. They change into the body and blood. I'm getting towards the end. They change. What does the Eucharist do? The Eucharist is an invitation to change. Our Lord took bread and said, this is my body. He took the cup and said, this is my blood. Whenever we receive the Eucharist, it's an invitation for us to ask ourselves, Lord, what area of my life are you calling me to improve upon? Look, sometimes we think, well, when I look at the Ten Commandments, I have not stolen, I have not killed, I have not lied, etc., etc., etc. Very good. Bravo, ragazzo. Excellent student. But Life is not just about what you have done. Life is also about what you have not done. When a rich young man comes to Jesus in Matthew 19, he said, good master, what must I do? Our Lord recites the commandments. He said, you know what, Jesus, I can give you a run for your money. I've kept all of those. And scripture says the Lord looked at him and loved him, which means what he said was true. But the Lord said to him, you lack something, my good young man. Go sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. And the Bible says he went away sad, for he was a man of great wealth. Oftentimes, and this is what I would like us to keep in mind. It is not so much what we have done, but what we have failed to do. In the last judgment, the seriousness of what we have failed to do confronts us. Our Lord said, when I was hungry, you did not give me food. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me to drink. When I was in prison. So all those are omissions. So what I want us to remember is the Eucharist is not just about commissions, but even more omissions. And finally, the Eucharist and community. I would say this. We are going through a year of the Eucharist in the U.S. Church. And I thank Father Paul very much for this initiative to talk about the Eucharist this evening. You notice what is central about the Eucharist. It's about community. The Eucharist is never something that is alone. Whenever we are a Eucharistic people, it means we are people of communion. We are people of community. In effect, we are Eucharistic to the extent that we build the parish family. The Eucharist widens our notion of family. The Eucharist inserts us into this larger family. This family that we come from east, west, north, and south, and we are all members of this great family. If you look at even Acts chapter 2, verse 42, 
The early Christians understood this very well. And a parish is beautiful. A parish is glorious to the extent that the Christians of that parish understand themselves to be a Eucharistic family. You can't enjoy the Eucharist alone. You can't be Eucharistic alone. You are Eucharistic to the extent that you invest in building the parish family. Nobody will do it for you. Nobody will do it for me. Notice what our Lord said to Saul. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Which means our Lord identifies himself with the church. And I cannot emphasize this more than enough. We have to give of ourselves to build this family. Nobody will do it for us. You can't defer it to another. It's not easy. But the Lord counts on us. This is what I will end with. We might think that we are the ones bringing the energies forth to build the family. But it is the Lord. It is not us. And to the extent that we become a Eucharistic people, to the extent that we give of ourselves, to the extent that we consciously see each other as a Eucharistic person, so does the parish family grow and become more beautiful. So let us pray as we conclude this hour before the Lord that all of us will really do all in our power that our parish will grow as a Eucharistic parish. Whenever the Eucharist is the center of parish life, the parish blossoms because Jesus is the one who grants the growth. For if the Lord does not build the house, in vain do the builders labor. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, O praise and all thanksgiving, be every moment that. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, O praise and all thanksgiving, be every moment that. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, O praise and all thanksgiving, be every moment that. Thank you for listening to another edition of WQPH's Local Matters. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast and hope you have a blessed week.